Very good. We are going to um, investigate discovering the human oocyte by utilizing a tool that can be defined as quantitative polarized light microscopy. It's a device that was invented um, at Woods Hole and at uh, the, the Women's Hospital in Rhode Island. And early researchers with this were Rudolf Oldenburg and David Keefe. Um, and it has been known over time as the poloscope, the spindle view, and now the oocyte. Um, it's an interesting device, and it can present images to us of human oocytes or other oocytes from the mammalian um, that show us things in these living cells that we could heretofore never see. So with that in mind, we'll talk about clinical applications of the device. We'll talk a little bit about how the device actually functions, what it's doing when it's mounted on an inverted microscope, and uh, how it can be applied for the benefit of embryologists who want to improve clinical results, who want to see things um, within an oocyte, and who also perhaps want to do somatic cell nuclear transfer. So with that little bit of an intro, we'll begin. So, so beginning as far back as 1918, scientists were investigating the beginnings of life. And E.B. Wilson offered a quotation that embryogenesis begins during oogenesis. And uh, in a manner of speaking, I guess that answers the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? It would appear that it may well have been the egg. Um, the oocyte's role in embryogenesis is no doubt important. I think everyone would agree with that. It acts as the fundamental host for ensuring a fertilized embryo, embryo for ensuing the fertilized embryo can properly divide. Um, it carries with it half the chromosomal complement of the embryo, the maternal complement. Um, it completes the meiotic process, ensures monospermic function. So when when the sperm and the egg combine, and the first sperm actually enters through the zona pellucida, um, the oocyte, when properly functioning, actually releases cortical granules and closes access to all the other sperm that may be involved. Um, decondenses the sperm head to release the male component of the chromosomes, um, and then undergoes pre-implantation pre development. Um, also, the egg is the storehouse for maternal mitochondrial RNA, and they certainly complete various developmental functions. Um, and so the goal of embryologists and folks involved in clinical fertility assistance, um, one of their goals is to predict the outcome from an art cycle. And statistically and in the literature, it has been shown that only five to 10% of all oocytes are intrinsically capable of producing in vitro embryos, at least embryos with full developmental potential. So that tells us you have to go through a lot of eggs to help patients become pregnant. Um, morphological criteria are up until these days, basically all that have been available to try and identify which embryo has the ability to produce a full-term pregnancy. Um, of course, saying that, we'll all recognize that we've moved towards embryo biopsy and uh, with the ability to cryopreserve embryos and get a genetic analysis taken care of and then transfer a frozen thought embryo, um, we do have tools beyond strict morphology these days. So for this reason, Assisted reproduction technologies left to rely on implanting multiple embryos to a certain extent, uh, and perhaps especially for what would be considered more difficult patient uh, scenarios. And that's one of the ways to com combat the low success rates and to successfully help folks have a child. Um, so we can even roll this back before the embryo and begin to ask the question are there identifiable predictors? in the oocyte that can inform us about this potential for developmental competency. Um, there are potential advantages for oocyte grading. Um, if we can improve 
grading methods at the very beginning. We can select more viable embryos. We can also rest assured that the burgeoning uh, realm of oocyte cryopreservation uh, can be considered at least a starting point for the oocyte grading so that you're, as a, as a scientist and as a clinician, folks are freezing what they know to be more likely to be viable oocytes. Um, if there are more parameters to rely on for single embryo transfer cases, which is, a, is really the goal these days to avoid high order multiples, um, if there are more parameters on which to base those decisions, uh, that's certainly an advantage. And if we can improve success in difficult cases, um, that certainly is a benefit for, for the patients. Um, to actually screen for PGD candidates, there's, you know, over the course of the last five to seven years, the um, prevalence of doing embryo biopsy, you know, we're, we're all familiar with that. The numbers have grown incredibly with the advent of blastocyst biopsy. Um, to the point where now we're actually seeing in the literature um, steps back towards less invasive technologies. And um, so if, if, the, if screening the oocyte, if actually grading the oocyte can screen for the potential of PGD, that can be considered beneficial. Along with improving prognosis for patients with dysfunctional oocytes, um, if you have a patient who presents with what appear to be oocytes that are not very functional across the entire cohort, um, this can be a diagnostic tool that helps uh, clinicians point the patient in particular towards perhaps um, oocyte donation. So this is a good clinical tool in that regard. Um, and nowadays with the prevalence again of more frozen thawed cryopreserved oocytes, um, this tool can be used to identify if there has been or if there is the potential for cryo damage in thought oocytes, uh, and with the goal being to improve the protocol for this cryopreservation. So, you know, the, the uh, I guess it was um, when we're in World War II, we were trying to um, decipher code and uh, the encryption of messages from across the Atlantic. Um, there was the story, it's a riddle wrapped in an enigma. Well, kids hear what they wanna hear. So what is that riddle that's wrapped up inside of an egg? Is the egg, the oocyte, an unknown? And what tools can be used these days to begin to identify which oocytes are more healthy and more viable? Current grading tools include a lot of different uh, morphology types of review. Um, to begin with, the cumulus morphology, um, the symmetry and the radial array of cumulus oophorus cells are linked to oocyte viability. Um, with that being said, and with the prevalence of ICSI cases these days, this is not necessarily an applicable um, mode unless you have it at the very beginning as a column in your morphological spreadsheet. Um, oocyte size is certainly telling, and giant oocytes are, uh, they occur, and they are, so, they are also known to be less viable, but it's a small percentage of the overall population, so it's kind of a rare event. Um, dysmorphic cytoplasm, um, a disrupted zona pellucida, these things are telltale and certainly uh, indicators of a less than viable oocyte. Um, any, anything that uh, is outside the norm, which is elucidated here by the elongated shape, thicker distorted zona, expanded paravitalin space, et cetera, these things are indicators of a degraded oocyte. Um, they're really conclusive only when this damage or deviation is severe. And again, that's a small percentage of the total population of retrieved oocytes. So there's Anecdotal reports of uh, another grading tool, which can be called the Olema elasticity. It's very subjective and it's probably only in indicative to those with a lot of experience who have done a lot of ICSI cases, who can have a feel for, at least visually, and perhaps a tactile feel for 
when the lemma itself is um, not very elastic, that can be considered uh, a telltale sign of less viable oocytes. Uh, but again, this is very subjective. So as we continue, polar body morphology, uh, the morphology of the first polar body has been shown to degrade over time in vitro, and that's where the work is done, and therefore has been investigated. Um, conflicting studies have shown um, different predictive uh, competency, I guess you would say or different predictive values. So the data is really kind of inconclusive. Um, early on, some of the first biopsy work that was done was polar body biopsy. And with that, you can analyze the chromosomal complement that's within the polar body, and it's been shown to have predictive values. Um, not a real practical tool for routine grading. And again, you're leaving off half of the, well, the, the actual, chromosomal complement that stays inside the oocyte, plus the paternal contributing factors are not assessed when you do polar body biopsy. So that, that's not uh, really ideal these days. So these methods that are available today, they're all helpful. And some of them are in use. And some of them are probably, in most cases, clinically too um, time consuming and less reliable than a facility would care to admit. So they're not necessarily used uh, beyond research um, and they fall short. And so that's probably why they're not used. Um, so what would constitute a good grading system when we're looking at an oocyte or a cohort of oocytes? The, the results based on whatever criteria are, are determined uh, Viable. They have to be reproducible, they have to be accurate, they have to be quantifiable, and they have to be sensitive enough to kind of suss out the differences in viability, um, even if those are small differences. And, and it's also certainly um, preferable if the technique or technology is non-invasive and can be applied to the majority of uh, oocytes that are retrieved. And it has to, you know, reproducible, accurate, quantifiable, and sensitive. That all boils down to being statistically significant. So, and it should be something that has been validated across many centers and with large sample sizes. And if you roll all of this, interestingly enough, there's there's a lot of review these days and application and research being done on time lapse. If all of these factors are rolled into a data set that's large enough for AI to look at the parameters, um, I would challenge that this is something for the future, but that AI could make use of all of the data that's captured by a quantifiable image um, slash measurement device and begin to roll that into the AI's algorithm for outcome. So reproducible and accurate. Let's see if all of these things that we um, know are necessary for a good grading scale, let's see if these things apply to quantifiable polarized light microscopy. It's by definition, it's calibrated and to a known standard. So it, it, it by nature gives data that's reproducible and accurate. Um, molecular organization and orientation of birefringent structures in the oocyte are automatically measured on a pixel by pixel basis. So anywhere that you point your cursor when you're using this tool, you're going to get a quantifiable data set. It's sensitive uh, down to 0 0.02 nanometers of retardance. Uh, retardance uh, will be defined, but that's in a way a definition, or it can be defined as the way the light that passes through highly organized molecules is attenuated under these different polarized states. So the spindle, the polar body, uh, I'm sorry, not the polar body, the spindle, the, the um, microtubules that contain the chromosomal complement inside of an oocyte, um, those microtubules are highly ordered molecularly and they present a spindle retardance in a range of two to three nanometers typically. So it's it's sensitive, certainly well above the noise floor of the tool. 
Um, it's non-invasive. Polarized light is by definition less invasive than, than uh, unfiltered light that is used to create images of oocytes and embryos. So it, it is less invasive and it in point of fact actually exposes the oocyte to less light than normal inverted microscopy when you're using Hoffman or DIC optics. So that's a good feature. Um, it's applicable to the majority of mammalian eggs. Um, it provides measurements of these structures that are present in the mature eggs. And those structures include the zona and the uh, spindle apparatus. And you can see uh, an image here that is captured using Hoffman and then an image that's captured using the quantifiable polarized light microscopy. And you see the, the bright pinpoints of light in these oocytes. That is, in fact, the, uh, the spindle apparatus, the microtubules that hold the metaphase plate. Um, so it's definitely applicable. The only mammalian eggs that this technique becomes a little harder to apply to are mammalian eggs with a lot of lipids in their cytoplasm. Um, they're not quite clear enough, and the lipids themselves attenuate the light. But certainly with bovine, uh, murine, and human, um, this technique is very applicable. Um, it's statistically significant. Um, studies exist that correlate spindle and zonometrics. They've been independently validated across many uh, faci uh, facilities or clinics, and they uh, have all generated statistics with significant p values. So I think that they can be counted on as reliable. And now we'll move on to a little bit more of the biological side of things, kind of segue into that. And I think we'll also come back to a little bit of talk about technically how does this device create these images. So people have taken oocytes and they've used dyes that bond or bind to the microtubules and the DNA at the metaphase plate. And they've created some very elegant images that show these spindles um, that are formed and are apparent during meiotic division. Um, this structure is responsible, responsible for proper chromosomal segregation uh, during these meiotic divisions and during the activation of the oocyte when the paternal and maternal chromosomes are, are blended to create the embryo. So the, the microtubules forming the spindle are dynamic. Um, we'll probably talk about it later on, but we know that the, the spindle itself is temperature sensitive. And uh, within an oocyte, if the temperature is allowed to fall, um, the spindle will depolymerize and it won't be visible. And when it's warmed back up to the proper 37C, um, the, the microtubules will repolymerize. And that that can occur um, both based on temperature and based on the dynamics of cell division. Um, and the spindle's highly, well, there we are. It's the spindle's highly sensitive to environmental changes such as temperature and pH. And these abnormalities that may occur in the spindle have been linked to failed or abnormal fertilization and poor embryo development along with failed implantation. So if we can identify the oocytes that have abnormal spindles, um, they can be kind of uh, set aside, if you will, with the use of the more viable oocytes brought to the fore clinically to improve results. So birefringence and the spindle, here's where we'll talk about the technology itself. How does it generate this image? Um, most familiar to folks that are doing clinical embryology is the use of the Hoffman contrast or relief contrast imaging, which uses polarized light to give kind of a 3D image to allow for the fine um, slicing of the focal plane as you focus up and down through an oocyte or an embryo. Um, this oocyte device, the quantifiable polarized light microscopy, um, is a completely different technology, even though it's using polarized light, um, that takes advantage of birefringence, which is an optical effect that's caused by molecular order inside of cells. And in an oocyte, uh, the microtubules in the spindle 
have a very uh, robust molecular order and um, they convey a lot of structural information, the birefringence of those molecules um, can be captured in microscopy and give us basically quantifiable information about optical density and orientation. And when we say orientation, we mean which way does the light get bent or refracted as it passes through these structures. Um, the Hoffman systems are insensitive to birefringence uh, they give a wonderful image, um, but they don't give us anything that's quantifiable. So quantifiable. So really, we're left only with kind of gross morphological human eye studies of the Hoffman-based images. The QPLM again quantifiable polarized light microscopy. It's capable of measuring things on a pixel by pixel basis within captured images, and all of that data is reproducible and can be related. Uh, down the timeline towards uh, the discernment of what's viable and what is not. So here's how it works. Okay, birefringence. Materials are birefringence. It's a physical property important in optics. When a single beam of mixed polarized light encounters birefringent material, it's split into two beams. Uh, one is the pure light passing through, and one is retarded or slowed down by a different angle of polarization. So if there's no inf uh, if there's no birefringence, um, the light's not retarded as it passes through the material, and it comes through as a single beam. If there is birefringence in certain of the polarized light states, the light itself is actually slowed down as it passes through the material because of those molecules, and there's a change in the phase of the x and y vectors. So to speak, the light is slowed down and approaches the camera that's capturing this light at a different angle that can be measured and strikes the camera at a different time that can also be measured. So that is retardance is defined as the distance between the faster and slower beams of light passing through these birefringent materials. Um, just as a point of interest, this technology is also useful in determining the quality of silicon wafers that are used when printing integrated circuits. So it works in biology and it also works in materials handling too. Um, and this difference can be measured. Um, and in our case, we're measuring this birefringence in distances as little as nanometers. Um, and, and again, this is kind of a, a very, um, what would you say basic um, graphic representation of how the light gets slowed down? And if you think about a camera being on the right side of that image and those beams of light striking the, the CCD chip in the camera at different times that are quantifiable based on the system's knowledge of the polarized state as the light goes through the material, that can be actually measured. And so biological materials with this high degree of linear order, molecular order, namely the spindle and the zona in an oocyte, which happen to be highly birefringent, uh, they create basically a, a um, definitive and quantifiable way of measuring the viability of those structures and thus the viability of the egg. So examples of a healthy spindle. The spindle is kind of football shaped, you can actually, to a degree, see the microtubules um, that are organized and contain the uh, chromosomes there at the metaphase plate. The incoming beams of light and one polarized state pass through it quickly, and another polarized state pass through it a little bit more slowly. And that spindle retardance can be measured and captured. And, uh, if you're ever able to actually work with one of these devices, you'll find that the software over the years has improved to the state to the point where the capturing of the spindle retardance and the capturing of the birefringence um, of the zona um, have both been automated and allow for um, egg metrics to be captured in a very elegant and automated manner. So the spindle that has a high degree of molecular order is an indication of health. That's the conclusion. 
unhealthy spindles with microtubules that are not exactly symmetrical or are less dense. Um, the light goes through, there's the fast and the slow outgoing beams, and the spindle retardance number as measured uh, at one nanometer in this example is an indication that there's not a higher degree of molecular order and thus this oocyte itself could be considered less viable. So those are kind of the, the key concepts and these now as we talk about the device are the things that it can measure, the azimuth or the orientation of the light, uh, the long axis of the birefringent structure and the way that that light then is redirected with a different polarized state because there's actually a when you see the device you'll see there's a polarizing filter above the material that's being uh, imaged and below it there's a liquid crystal polarizer and that liquid crystal when it realigns creates these different polarized states that allows for this measurement um, in the case of the spindle apparatus the azimuth follows the long axis of the spindle fibers and one can identify that barrel shape versus abnormal orientation. So there's a normal barrel shaped spindle and the vectors, uh, the vector overlay as measured can be defined and visually um, overlaid on the image. And then here's a tripolar spindle that's very disrupted and you can see those vectors and I'm sorry, that would be an indication that this is a less than viable oocyte because again, right across the center of those vectors in the, in the middle and perpendicular to the vectors is where the metaphase plate aligns. And if you have a tricornate or a tripolar spindle, um, the supposition is, is that those chromosomes are fairly disrupted and that the egg itself is not that viable. So, there are um there is in the literature quite a lot of publication about visualizing the metaphase to meiotic spindle and oocytes using the device as it was originally called the pole scope um, and then bringing it forward into the future as it's now called the oocyte device that show uh, indications of embryonic developmental competence based on the structure and biofringence of the spindle. So that's, that's an egg with a spindle. This is an egg without a spindle. If the egg doesn't have a spindle at all, um, I don't think any of us would be surprised to learn that when it was fertilized, it, it may arrest right then and there. Um, and approximately 20% of oocytes lack a visible spindle. And uh, so we would consider those probably suspect even when it comes to selecting for cryopreservation. Um, the percent of fertilization and development to high quality embryos of spindle positive versus spindle negative. Um, these are statistics from a variety of papers um, moving forward in time where you can see the spindle is visible, yes or no. And then you can see the fertilization rate and you can see the high quality embryo um, differentials as we go through all these papers. Um, it's pretty compelling and it's indicative of the fact that amongst a cohort or amongst a much larger study um, of oocytes that visualizing the spindle versus not visualizing it um, gives a gross determination of viability in its own right. Um, spindle imaging as a new marker for optimal timing of ICSI. This was a pretty valid um, consideration because if you are not visualizing a spindle or if the spindle is a directly adjacent to and still has not extruded from the polar body or the polar body hasn't extruded from the oocyte entirely, it's an indication that maybe a little more time in the incubator is due to get that oocyte ready for ICSI. Um, spindle negative oocytes may still be just a little slow and may require another hour or two in the, in, in the incubator to complete their maturation. So the absence of a biofringent spindle can be considered a consequence of maturation and or oocyte quality. Um, and deficiencies in the oocyte as well as adverse conditions during maturation um, 
are all prospective or potential causes for this individual oocyte to be considered less than viable. Um, and, you know, to follow up on this, you can use the polarized light microscopy and then amongst that cohort of oocytes that don't present a spindle, um, stains have been used to follow up and try and determine um, where in this developmental processes the, the failures have occurred. So is the, is the first polar body a good predictor of maturation? I mean, I think clinically folks use the polar body and time, time post retrieval to have a feeling for when to perform ICSI. Um, this quantified polarized light microscopy can also be a tool to use and assess the maturation of the oocytes. Um, not all oocytes progress through maturation at the same rate. Um, in the metaphase one oocyte, the mitotic spindle should be able to be visualized. And during maturation, the mitotic spindle, when it's visualized, can be looked at with regard to its maturity as well and its structure. Um, you know, the, the M1 telophase and anaphase oocytes already exhibit an extruded polar body. So why the polar body in itself could be considered a little bit inaccurate, unless you add on the component of the timeline, is because of this occurrence, which across a large number of eggs is bound to happen once in a while. You'll be able to see the polar body, but without the use of the oocyte device showing you that the spindle and the polar body have not completely segregated, um, you wouldn't know that. And you might consider this egg to be ready for ICSI when, in fact, it needs a little more time to fully segregate. So that leads to a potential risk for aneuploidy and non-viable embryos, embryos and so the suggestion to wait until this oocyte reaches M2 before ICSI is well-founded. Here's another example of that, um, just showing you that the polar body and the spindle complex haven't completely segregated, um, and that it does happen, you know, over time across a, a body of eggs that are being handled clinically. So, Representation of M2 oocytes showing different angles of deviation from the, from the spindle. So the first polar body doesn't necessarily predict the accurate location of the spindle. And because here to four without the use of this technology it couldn't be visualized it being the spindle, um, people began to examine whether the relationship between the spindle and the polar body um, could be considered telltale as far as another indicator for viability. Um, here, everything's aligned. Here, the spindle would be said to be at 2 o'clock relative to the polar body, maybe 3 o'clock here, um, and so on and so forth. But you can see, as we go through all of these images, that the spindle's relative alignment in relation to the polar body uh, varies from one egg to another. And I think embryologists that have been active in the field for quite a while know that the polar body itself can kind of slide around um, if you actually move it um, and are probably as little bit less attached to things before even before it's extruded than the spindle itself which is there in the cytoplasm so these attempts were uh, obviously this takes a lot of time diligence and study and Deviations from the first polar from the first polar body to the spindle position. Um, looking at that and looking at outcomes, uh, I would give kudos to the researchers because I think it was probably a pretty grueling process. And uh, these this data that was published cites a significantly lower fertilization rate for most sites where the spindle is located at an angle of greater than 40 degrees away from the polar body. So again, this is something that can be further automated and can be considered uh, telltale with regards to expected outcomes. Um, the mitotic spindle location and identification and its effect on embryonic cleavage is, is really a nice way to boil all of these uh, observations down into um, kind of a data set. And they help also um, when doing ICSI, 
uh, if you visualize the spindle, you can certainly know to avoid it with your ICSI needle. Um, and in anyone's hands, uh, if you begin to develop a feel for where to place the sperm when doing ICSI um, and gather that data set um, with regard to the alignment, you can come up with um, prospectively whether or not in your own hands there's an effect on the FERT rate. Um, the FERT rate didn't show itself to be predictive. It wasn't significant. But the quality of embryos that were developed and the average embryo score for this parameter were both shown, at least in this one paper, to be predictive. So it's kind of interesting. And again, it's, it's very rigorous to get to that point, especially in the days when these studies were done, because the system itself had not become as automated as it is now. Um, but the embryos that uh, have been studied for a relationship between the cleavage plane and embryo morphology is also another application of this technology that has caught researchers' eye and shows some interesting results. Um, as we track through this and determine the cleavage plane for that first cell division. All of these things, um, again, showed a valid uh, statistically significant p value. And uh, again, I guess in a way it's to say not surprising that the, the, the oocytes and then divided cells that are becoming embryos that show the highest grading score um, have the better outcome. So the study proposes that the spindle accurately marks the animal poles in a human oocyte and provides evidence linking the meiotic spindle location to the first cleavage plane and resulting early embryo development. Again, something that can prospectively become a little bit more automated in the future um, if deemed beneficial on a clinical basis. So, this now is kind of a rendering of the spindle complex and the metaphase plate where the uh, microtubules kind of constrain and or gather the chromosomal DNA materials. And you can imagine if the spindle complex is not symmetrical and hasn't collected the metaphase plate um, in a in a symmetrical but rather in a random manner that it's more likely to be dysfunctional. Um, early on these studies were done utilizing uh, dyes but these are not vital dyes and so the oocytes once the images were captured were no longer viable so that's kind of a difficulty but they do make elegant images and um, everyone I'm sure has seen graphs that show and knows full well that the the older the patient, the older the woman is, the less likely her contribution of oocytes is uh, going to be in great number viable. It's, you know, fertility declines with age. And uh, this mitotic spindle alteration in older women is no doubt part and parcel um, the reason why uh, fertility declines, or, you know, with, with age. So, now it's possible to get these images, to form good images of the spindle in living oocytes without damaging them either with the dye or with the fluorescent light. Um, the IVF lab can finally benefit from this earlier basic research um, by showing spindle multipolarity and abnormal microtubule alignment. The oocyte makes it possible to reject eggs that would result in aneuploid embryos. So what you're looking for is the normal barrel shape, uh, the vectors indicate the spindle's long axis. What you're wanting to avoid are oocytes with dislocated and multipolar spindle complexes. Um, and all of these things now can be captured in an automated manner. Um, this quantifiable polarized light microscopy is sensitive, sensitive enough to detect this spindle misalignment. Um, again, example images, because these images are. Uh, very telltale. Uh, these are what you would expect to see when using the device. A good egg and a less than good egg here with a multipolar spindle. Um, further examples of a disrupted spindle. Um, 
this is truly measurable um, with the use of this QPLM technology. So, all right, we've seen that we can actually visualize the spindle. Um, let's say you have a cohort of eggs and they all are presenting symmetrical spindles and you want to find slice viability uh, expectations even further, then measuring the actual amount of retardance in that spindle as the light passes through it is possible. So we can come up with a mean spindle retardance number where the, the one uh, polarized state that allowed the light to pass through these molecules directly and the secondary polarized state or states, because it's actually several states that are captured, um, that measure the retardance of the light passing through. Um, that quantifiable number of 2.95 specific to this spindle and the number as it relates to other spindles is also indicative of viability. And in essence, to simplify all of that, the higher the retardance number given a symmetrical spindle, the more viable that egg is likely to be. Um, the higher mean retardance correlates to a better pronuclear score and better embryonic development. Um, these are numbers of embryos also graded as to the uh, PN score using the Scott and Smith uh, methodology. And you can see that um, the higher the score, the better the egg is basically what it boils down to. Um, and that shows true across different sites and different uh, researchers using this similar technology with similar protocols. So all statistically significant in most cases and quite interesting. And uh, of course, the more abnormal the egg, the higher the statistical significance. So where, where you draw that line becomes kind of a clinical decision, but uh, at least it's a tool that allows you to have the ability to make that decision. Um, so this is boiling down to basically egg grading. Um, egg, this egg grading based on the symmetry, the birefringence, and now also we can talk about the length of the spindle because that can be measured. So this spindle in particular, 18.32 microns. This spindle, uh, let's see, just 12.75 microns. Um, these same studies document that the shortened spindle correlates with the lowest PN score and a lower developmental rate to blastocyst. So it's another telltale, it's another column in your morphological spreadsheet that helps with the assessment of the outcome uh, predictability. And uh, these are numbers again that were showing some statistical significance, at least between the, uh, the scores A, B, C, and D as compared to the group four score abnormal. Certainly the abnormal eggs had shorter spindles. Um, so, okay, that, uh, that's kind of a good overview and synopsis of the egg grading story. Um, now we can talk about egg freezing and the spindle because certainly oocyte cryopreservation is much more prevalent these days. Um, Pre-freeze, when you have an oocyte, um, you'll be able to visualize that spindle complex. It'll have high retardance. Um, Mid-process, as the egg's going through the uh, various solutions leading up to vitrification, um, that spindle disappears. Those microtubules depolymerize. And then once you've fully thawed and warmed the oocyte that has been cryopreserved, that spindle should reappear and the, the numbers associated with the visualization and quantifiability of those numbers of the spindle complex should begin to match. Um, cycling an egg through a freeze and thaw, I suppose you could say it's inevitable. Well, it is inevitable that the spindle will depolymerize. Um, it may not be inevitable that the egg loses viability, but there is a chance that cycling an egg through a freeze-thaw thaw activity can reduce viability. So using the tool to determine um, basically the efficacy of the crowd preservation technique is, is a useful concept. Um, staining and electron microscopy have 
been used to show that spindles depolymerize and that they only are sometimes partially restored when they warm. Um, and this work goes back into the 80s. Um, monitoring the spindle up to the point of freezing and then post uh, thawing or during the, the initial thawing processes, using this technology have shown that the spindle is dynamic and it does have the propensity to fully reform, uh, giving, uh, giving the fact that the thaw process has, process has been properly executed. Um, we would hate to think that eggs suffer from being frozen. And uh, certainly the field in general uh, with the application of vitrification has gotten much, much better with survival and with uh, fertilization. But uh, using this technology to tweak um, your protocols to try and always find a little room for improvement is uh, very valid. Um, depending on the insult, the spindle will return on warning, uh, if you want to call it an insult. When it returns, it's a new structure and with potentially change, uh, changed structure that may or may not have affected functional capacity. Um, frequently, the spindle, the new spindle, uh, after a temperature excursion, is shown to have less molecular order. And again, we've seen already that that correlates to uh, poorer FERT rates and even poorer embryo viability. So um, here's sequential imaging of a freezing process going into, you see the spindle, you see the spindle. Um, the oocytes retain the spindle um, when cooled to room temperature and cryoprotectants. Um, but once it's in the straw or whatever vessel is being utilized, you can't really make that observation. Um, immediately upon thawing, um, only 20 to 50% of the eggs may uh, present a visible spindle. Um, all the spindles vanish during the washing process, and then they come back or repolymerize uh, during the next few hours once they're back in a uh, a suitable environment, a suitable media at the right temperature. So time after thawing, if you look at proportion of oocytes showing a spindle, um, either strong or weak, um, seems like the longer you wait, the better it is for the spindle. It allows it a chance to uh, reconstruct, if you will. Um, mouse oocytes have a sim similar uh, recovery time. Uh, that makes them a nice practice tool. Um, and spindle morphology, um, as evaluated by this technology before and after thawing, is, uh, you know, a work that's, again, rigorous and important. Um, oocytes with spindles of higher quality at the beginning are more likely to survive vitrification and thawing um, as compared to oocytes that didn't have what were deemed high quality. Um, but, of course, that's true even when you go straight to fertilization. So probably not a surprise, um, but still a way to qualify for egg banks and facilities that are banking eggs, um, which eggs will give you the best expectation So for success. So we'll, we'll move now from the work and considerations around cryopreservation to the zona, because the zona itself uh, presents another a uh, group of molecules that are highly birefringent and can be visualized with this tool and can be uh, added to the column for morphology that gives you another indication of outcome expectation. Um, these are zona proteins that are quite amazing when looked at under electron microscopy. Um, when you look at an egg using typical clinical inverted scopes with Hoffman or DIC, you can certainly visualize the, the, the zona and you can even see that it's trilaminate in some instances with real good resolution. Um, and we know that abnormalities in the zona have been linked to failed or abnormal fertilization and poor embryo development, but it hasn't heretofore been quantifiable. So again, we come back to the biological relevance of these molecular structures um, and these structures that are highly birefringent can be viewed as to, again, the, the way the light gets refracted moving through them. 
the timing of the light as it passes through them in different polarized states can be measured. Um, just like the spindle, you can see a faster and a slower outgoing beam of light having passed through the zona, and that can be measured. And so the inner zona that has a high degree of molecular order and is homogeneous around the circumference of the egg, uh, to sum it up, that's going to be considerably more viable than an egg that has a zona that is kind of uh, not as homogeneous and not as highly birefringent. So an example of the fast outgoing beam, the slower outgoing beam, and a less uh, retardant measurement that's been captured. Um, Birefringence increases when the structural integrity um, is better, and therefore it's an indicator of health. So the inner zona that has a lower degree of molecular order may be considered less viable. Um, and here we come back to the azimuth measurement. Um, you see how nicely um, homogeneous this zona is and also how the light gets bent, kind of like the spokes coming out of the center of a wheel. Um, it's a transverse arrangement of the glycoproteins. Um, there aren't weak spots in this zona that can be identified by looking at um, what we would call the typical arrangement. And the same is true for the, the outer uh, laminar layer of the zona. This is what you want to see in healthy eggs. Um, sorry, let's see. So the azimuth orientation is also another piece of the puzzle that can be identified and reviewed using this technology. Uh, the weak spots in the zona can be identified. And what you don't want to see is a zona with a uh, high degree of these weaknesses or variabilities across the, uh, the zona layers. Retardance of the inner, inner layer has been shown to correlate with conception cycles. Um, this is an automated feature of the device, along with the, the ability to capture the spindle image and its data set. You can now capture the data set and the uh, birefringent levels of the zona itself. The mean retardance of the area that you see in red is 4.71 nanometers. Um, here is a I guess you would kind of say a weaker indication of viability with the mean retardance at 2.22. So the greater the inner zona retardance, the, uh, the greater that number, the more that correlates with better embryo development and the greater probability of conception. And you can kind of chase back through the literature and see the evidence and see the end behind these statements. Um, that's what's quantifiable about this. Um, and this is kind of a, a neat way of looking at it with regard to the um, quantifiable analysis of the first layer of the zona and the degree of birefringence um, comparing pregnancy um, and then a non-pregnant outcome. Um, certainly the higher the birefringence of the, the first layer of the zona, the more likely the outcome will be, will be positive. Um, Kind of an interesting finding and hopefully this is not something that's gotten buried in time because this is 15 year old data um, the inner zona retardance again from another center shown to be predictive of blast development the thickness of the inner layer a simple measurement of the thickness of the inner layer is shown to correlate with conception cycles um, so you can measure you know um, Kind of the radius from the from the center of the egg out measure the distance across the inner zona and uh, begin to see correlations there between it and the outcome as well the thicker the inner layer the better uh, the embryonic development and the greater probability of conception and again here are some outcomes with the number stated sorry uh, with the number of cycles that were both um, positive and non-conceiving uh, and the statistical significance of that zona length uh, is shown to be valid in this study, in these two studies. So that's kind of the overview. We've talked about how it works. We've talked about what it's able to allow people to visualize um, when studying oocytes and hopefully 
Um, over time, as the tool itself has been further developed, the automation of the capturing of the uh, biorefringence of the spindle and the zona have made life easier for folks that are using this. Um, so to summarize those metrics, the mean spindle retardance, the spindle length, the spindle orientation or the, the azimuthal skew from barrel shape. So that means basically, is it football shaped or is it multi-cornate, so to speak? And uh, screening for anaphase, telophase, M1 oocytes, allowing the spindle complex to fully segregate from the polar body. Um, those are useful metrics or useful things to visualize. And with regard to the inner zona, it's um, maximum uh, retardance and its length across the zona. All of these are the, the currently um, noted metrics that can be gleaned when you study oocytes with the use of this quantifiable polarized light microscopy. Um, other applications exist in the world out there. Um, laboratory quality assessment. If you don't see spindles in a lot of your eggs, um, it's time to consider whether your pH and your temperature keeping activity in the incubators is accurate enough. Um, so there's a high probability that it might be a non-biological reason, and those reasons can be temperature, pH, and handling. Um, certainly, if you're involved in a group that's doing nuclear transfer, uh, for somatic cell nuclear transfer, for research or um, therapeutic cloning, um, the increase uh, from the Oregon Center, Oregon Primate Research Center, Dr. Mitalopov, um, he increased from 3 to 25 percent of success doing SCNT, somatic cell nuclear transfer, in oocytes when using this tool versus using a stain and UV light. Um, much less invasive, um, maintains viability of the oocytes, lets the researcher get on with his work. Um, I mean, if you can increase from 3 to 25 percent, um, when working on SCNT, you've really improved your uh, throughput tremendously. So you can study spindle changes over tr over time in treated versus non-treated oocytes. So this is to uh, this is kind of almost like a toxicology study. Um, how how do different substances affect oocytes and the spindle itself? Um, These are some of the key benefits. You can actually improve pregnancy results from cryopreserved oocytes by using the system to select against um, oocytes that may have suffered cryo damage. You can improve pregnancy results by selecting embryos that exhibit structurally normal spindle and zona at the time of ICSI. Um, oocytes with a well-formed zona are eight times more likely to lead to pregnancy than those with a weak zona. You can avoid injecting a sperm into an egg that's not fully mature. Um, if you suss yourself back through the studies, you'll see that it's one out of every 20 oocytes likely that are still only in meiosis one, and yet they've exhibited a extruded polar body. So give them a little more time and then inject. And uh, you know these are all steps toward improved outcome. Um, you can avoid damaging the gymnatic material during ICSI by simply visualizing the spindle and um, avoiding it. And you can improve embryo, embryo quality by positioning the spindle in the 12 o'clock position for ICSI instead of at the polar body, instead of the polar body itself. Um, improving the efficiency of nuclear transfer um, goes without saying, uh, well published, um, makes nuclear transfer almost possible as opposed to having to use fluorescence and dyes. Um, these comments um, with regard to this device in a clinical setting um, should be considered uh, subjects for research only. It's a patented device. It's intended for non-clinical research use. Um, but how, do you how can we improve clinical outcomes without doing research? We can't. So, um, I hope that this has been a, a pretty good overview of the system, of the technology.
And uh, if we take it from the penguins, you know, they've, uh, they've been reproducing for years with frozen eggs and sperm. So I guess it's about time that we have now caught up and hats are off to all the embryologists that day in and day out do this work and with the, with the entirely uh, noble goal of improving clinical outcomes for their patients. Thank you very much.